the summers and the weekends I'm working, I'm like, people are asking for this wine stuff. You know, I was very businessy already. Somebody would come in, they're like, do you have Camus Cabernet? I'm like, no, I don't think we have it. I would look it up and be like, this is $30? You know, because we were some five, ten dollar wines. Right. So that's interesting. And then my life, literally, my life changed in one moment. We're back, another episode here at Club Thirty. How we doing, Jay? Doing great. Season two. Getting a little bit better we'll each time. Every time, incremental improvements. It's not what life's all about. <laughs> it's about the process, right? <laughs> it's about the process. <laughs> speaking of, speaking of. Today's guest is all about the process, Gary V. I recently met him at an event and just his energy. I love it and uh, he's interesting. What can you say about Gary before we uh, get into the episode today? Yeah, I think that uh, he's a really inspirational guy, obviously. Um, he's so inspiring that, you know, 10th of the population of the U.S. follows him on social media, but there's a reason and it's because his approach and his process from uh, a three-year-old immigrant from Belarus to stock boy in a liquor store to building a business empire in first in wine, then in media and in sports has been uh, inspiring. And uh, it's an outlier. Mm -hmm. And and I think that um, what I found most interesting about the conversation wasn't about the things he's done, but how he did them. And I just I really enjoyed how present he was, how willing he was to share those insights with us and obviously our, our Club 30 members. Uh, it's a conversation all I'm going to remember. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and to me, it's so much how you approach things, mm -hmm. challenges, your mindset. Uh, that was my goal when inviting Gary to this sit down. And uh, I hope you guys, the listeners, will enjoy this episode as much as we did sitting down with Gary. So let's do it. Without further ado, Gary V. He's a Belarusian American entrepreneur, investor, author, media personality, and his way of inspiring people in the work and in life has helped grow his following to over 30 million people. Welcome to Club 30, Gary V. Thank you, King. Um, Welcome, Gary. to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Listen, uh, we recently met for the yes. first time. You were kind enough to swing by my launch of my fragrance, Next Chapter. It smells remarkable, everyone. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, you know what? The, ne the following day, I thought to myself, Gary would be the perfect guest for Club 30. Thank you. For, for two reasons. One, I want to get to know you even better. Thank but you. two... This is a great opportunity for our listeners to hear your insight on so many things. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm humbled. You're a busy really man. Am. But um, when I watch you, listen to you, I feel like there's so much passion in everything you do. Where Where is that coming from? You know, I think, I think I have very strong clarity. You know, the luck of the draw of being an immigrant having very little, growing up with a mom who I think was incredibly thoughtful. And, you know, just the serendipity of the way my life played out, I, I, I feel like I'm not confused. And let me, let me say what I mean by that. I don't understand how a human that's listening to this or that lives in the world doesn't recognize how remarkable it is to be a human. There are incredible challenges in being a human. There's many things always going on, whether in the macro or in one's individual status. Today, somebody will go to the doctor and get diagnosed with cancer, terminal. Today, somebody will lose a loved one. Today, there'll be macro things going in the world. Everyone knows that. That being said, in reverse, every day that something atrocious doesn't happen to you is actually the greatest. <laughs> and so I've, I'm incredibly driven by gratitude. Every day I wake up and my phone doesn't have, I didn't have to be woken up in the middle of the night of something terrible. Every day something bad hasn't happened to the 10 or 15 people that mean the most to me. I genuinely, not like the bullshit, you know, motivational quote on social media or on your calendar, I genuinely view that as a epic thing. I'm excited, I'm on the offense, you know, in general as a human. And so 
I'm very passionate. I'm pumped that I got to be a human. I could have been a hippo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it could have yeah. been a flower, like a ladybug. Like human is the apex of something that's alive. And mm. we're also living in a great era. I know people mm. are very, especially now, there's a lot of challenges going on. But if we just rewind the clock 100 years from today, the second we're sitting here, you know, we're on our way to going into, we're in the roaring 20s and it seemingly is good. For the next 25 years, the world is going to be incredibly conflict with two world wars, life expectancy in its 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. Like, we have it good. Not everyone listening right now is it good because something bad might have happened. They might be in an abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. They might be dealing with mental health issues. They may be dealing with health issues. I get that. My push to everyone who isn't dealing with something extreme is choose to be optimistic versus pessimistic and cynical, and you will be flabbergasted on how much more joy you will have. And so the reason I produce so much content is I believe that people who do see from a perspective of hope and love and joy and good have a bigger responsibility in our society right now to start producing more content because I believe that negativity and cynicism and darkness is very loud. Mm -hmm. And I feel like light and happiness and joy, they keep it in their circle. They keep it amongst their 12 friends. And I, I'm willing to deal with the ramifications of a public figure life and all the judgment and the ridicule and the misunderstanding and all the lack of mm. privacy and all the things that come along with it because I think it's my responsibility that I got fortunate. And I don't love using lucky, but I, in this instance, I'll say it. Lucky with the DNA and the mm. parents I had and I want to be loud, and I want every single person who's listening right now to realize, if you want to find negativity in the world, it'll take you two seconds. You can turn on the news, you can go on social and find certain stuff. But if you want to find positivity, you can do it in a second. You don't put on the news, <laughs> and on social and digital, you find people that are pushing progress, happiness, advancement, offense, and there are millions of them, and I just challenge people to decide for themselves because you find what you're looking for. Your yeah, life right. is what you decide to look for. I, I love this. And, and so my question, you came to the US at three, three. years old. Yes. So how did your upbringing Everything. shape you? And, and, and I also like, wanna know when did you start to think about mindset? Yeah, late, um, but early, let me explain. So I think like for us, we were completely shaped by our childhood. Sure. DNA, sure, but nature, right? And, and, and nurture. And so I, I believe I'm in a small group of people, and it's not that small, 10, 20% of the world, that is the most fortunate. And I'll say this very slow because I think it may change the perspective of some listening. I believe the greatest way to have the best situation, to have the best potential to have a good life is to be born in, the, in this specific circumstance. To be born in a circumstance with not a lot, not a wealthy family, not a lot, but extreme love and happiness in the household. Because I believe what is happening, and I've, I, I know that about myself, and I watch it in a lot, of, I, basically for the last 20 years, I've been watching people, right? That's why I was so all in on social and was an investor in all those platforms. I believe that if you are lucky enough to be born into a family that is happy, genuinely, that yeah. it's a joy, you know, you can't, yeah, there's gonna be conflict here and there, but overall, net score, a joyous, optimistic family. And you also don't associate that happiness with the fact that you're rich, right? Because if you're born into a wealthy, happy family, you as a child are formed, of course, to believe there's a, gotta be a variable there of the wealth driving this joy. If you're born the way I was, I mean, when I came to America, the first, and I, I remember this, because by the time we got here, I was four, and we lived there until I was five and a half, six. I lived in a studio apartment, not much bigger than the room we're in right now, probably two and a half times bigger, tiny, with five to eight family members, depending on what was happening with our immigration. Right. Like, you know, I, I, can't, I can't even, you can't even comprehend how much of an advantage it is for a child to not have things, but have pure love. You're unstoppable. You yeah. never, as an adult, associate happiness with money. Every time I talk like this, including this podcast, I will get comments in my social saying, 
yeah, whatever. Like easy for you to say, you have money. Because they know me today. They don't know me from 22 to 30 when I never made more than $60,000 a year. They don't know me. I wasn't public. The world didn't work that way. So, I mean, my upbringing, and then I also had a mom who was very talented. She did something very smart. She built incredible self-esteem. I thought it was the best. But not entitled and delusional. So she grounded me a lot. It was also the 80s and she was from Russia, so I got a smack in the face at times. <laughs> it wasn't this political correct bullshit we live in now. Like my mom, I think one of the issues with modern parenting is we don't hold kids accountable. We do instill delusion. I believe eighth place trophies have ruined the world. We've demonized losing. I think one of the great advantage a lot of athletes have is no matter when they start sport, there's nothing mommy and daddy can do on the ice or the court, in the classroom, they can literally go and fight the teacher after the report card and change the grade. But on the ice, if you lost 4-2, you lost 4-2. Yeah. And and I think that's a big deal. Yeah, and, and to that point, I feel like, yeah, you learn a lot when you win, but you learn even more when you lose. Absolutely. You learn so much. So it's such an important part of growing up, playing sports or whatever you do. Losing teaches you Everything. so much and it gives you motivation Everything. too. And, and it's a good thing. Yeah. Oh, and you know, <clears throat> my my number one thing to parents is show me someone who's a poor sport, and I'll show you someone I want to get to know. I <clears throat> I I've watched my kids go through sports, and parents would be upset if their kid cried, and I would like run up to kids that would cry after losses and commend them. <laughs> You're showing me you care. I think being competitive is a remarkable gift. Indifference is devastating. Mm. I mean, mm. I cried basically every day of my life between six and 12 because I played everything, competed constantly, and there was not a time I lost between six and 12 <laughs> where I didn't break into tears because it, was, it hurt that much. It hurt that much. And, and I, 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 I'm devastated watching our society try to tell kids it doesn't matter. Meanwhile, they tell them grades in school does matter, when in reality, the day they become 22, it's the reverse. Competition matters in real life, and grades matter zero in real life. Mm, and right. so I think, I think you know, it was a huge shaper of mine, plus where, you know, we moved from Queens to New Jersey. I grew up in a 1980s Edison, New Jersey childhood, which meant my mom had no idea what I was doing. She knew I was in the general area. And what was cool back then is all your friends' parents were your parents too. Forget about my mom smacking me. Mm. It was fully okay for your friend's mom <laughs> to smack you. It was communal, right? It was sure. a different, it was different. You better behave. <laughs> you better behave at all yeah. times. But you know, it, you know, we we just lived outside. We, you know, we got into fights, we played sports. We sold lemonade and did business. I was just gonna ask mm -hmm. you, business, what, what yeah. was your first six, business? Six, seven, I sold lemonade. We we also, you know, I didn't just do the soft lemonade thing. We did shoveling snow. Mm. When it would snow, a lot of my friends in the neighborhood would go sledding, make snowmen. I grabbed the shovel and started ringing doorbells. Ma'am, would you like me to shovel your driveway for what, $5? What was driving that? Had no, uh, that's just, that goes back to what I'm so fascinated about humans. One of the things I talk about for a lot of people here who are discovering this content, I, I think you need to fight to find yourself. Here's what I mean by that. I have no idea, Henrik. It wasn't like, that was just DNA, right? Like I didn't, I was seven. But it, like, was it you want to make money early? It wasn't, you know, it's funny, and this is a huge advantage for, this is why I think entrepreneurship is confusing right now. I think in the last 10, 15 years, entrepreneurs have become more relevant, fame. Mm. This is crazy to me. I didn't, you know, I was 31 years old before I made a video. I grew up my whole, I was an adult before it even comprehend, it didn't even cross my mind that humans would know who I was. I thought people would know me in the wine business, in the, in the business world, sure, because I was in that. But the thought that on the walk here, somebody might say hi or a selfie, it, it, businessmen weren't famous. That wasn't a thing. Um, no, to me it was, and this is and what I'm scared about is people are now chasing the money. People want to be entrepreneurs for the fame and the money. Mm. The problem is entrepreneurship's hard. Yeah, it's really hard, and it's extremely lonely. 
you know, you're at the top of an organization and everything's your fault. And everything's your responsibility. It's, be, it's like being a parent. It's all fun and games until you're a parent. You know, like every, everybody goes through this. They have all sorts of judgment of their parents until they become a parent. And they're like, wait a minute. Yeah, I get it. Now. And so, anyway, no, back going back, Henry, I just had no idea. It was who I was. In the same way that I, I look at athletes, I look at musicians, I look at artists, I, teachers, stay at home parents. Like, my mom was destined genuinely to be a stay at home mother and like raise a family. And like, I'm the great beneficiary of that. I think a lot of people compromise their, their greatest skills because they don't think they can make money in it. I think about all my friends who were remarkable at video games when it wasn't clear that video games were a business. And so they didn't, at eight, they thought they had to get a real job. Mm -hmm. But had they stayed and played video games, they might Maybe be the Tony switch. Hawk right. of video mm. games today, the way it played out. Sure. And so I think people need to chase passion and then live within the means of what that financial outcome is. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it's like chasing passion doesn't mean you have a specific thing in mind, but it's a way of doing. Mm. And what I mean by that is like, it could be uh, wanting to be helpful yeah. or wanting to solve problems yeah. and, and figuring out like, that's my and mode. And to your point, I love solving problems. So that can mean, I love what you're saying. So that can mean, oh, you're destined to become an engineer. Exactly. Because engineers solve problems. Oh, you're destined to be a therapist. Because that solves problems. Oh, you're destined to be a guidance counselor in a middle school. Oh, mm -hmm. you're destined to be an entrepreneur because you're going to create a product that solves a problem. Like, I like that. I agree with that. I think that's a, I think what that does for people is it gives them a little bit more room to figure themselves out. Because you have to take the first step. Because you'll never know how to take the second one unless you take the first one, which is leading into a process or a way of being rather than a specific thing. I think a lot of people listening to this will like this analogy. I love sports. Obviously, I'm establishing that. In my office, I talk about to employees, I just recently had some young man work for me and he was doing a certain role. And I said, hey, you're an extrovert. You're not cross your T's and dot your I's. You're doing a cross your T's and dot your I's job now. You need to get out of this. Sure. And, we, and I said, look, my job as CEO is to put players in a position to succeed. Very hardcore sports analogy. The most fascinating thing I watch in sports is the variable of a head coach. Because it's, you know, especially within a, within a season, I, anytime a team in any of the four major sports fires a manager or head coach in season, even if I don't follow that team, I kind of keep a little eye on the next month of what that team does because it speaks to the actual variable of that person. Right. Right? It is the same players. It's not the next season. You know, I think, you know, and you know this, Henrik, I think fans are naive. A team seemingly is the same as last year, but many things happen. Everybody's a year older. Anything can happen. And by the way, one player, let alone three different players, changes everything. Potentially, yeah, yeah. especially if one of those three players is special or the reverse. You get rid of one cancerous, cynical player, changes the entire locker room. So in-season coaches coming is like one of my biggest fascinations. Do you view your companies uh, from a sports standpoint almost? Do you see yourself as a coach yes. or a, more as a coach than a, as a boss? A hundred percent. I see myself, first of all, I think that almost every CEO and boss has it wrong. I even it was funny when you even said the word of what happened in my stomach. It didn't feel good yeah. because I think the world has defined boss as person that tells you what to do, mm -hmm. person that's keeping you accountable. I I feel that I work for every employee and I really show up that way. And I feel like I have to dictate the strategy. Yeah. Right? Uh, so yes, I do think more of myself as a coach, as a parent, as a guidance counselor, as an older brother, feels very appropriate. Uh, I am the oldest in my family and I was in a family where it was, again, it was an immigrant family. So my mom, I mean, from the time, I mean, from the time I was six, I remember my mom saying like, you have to take care of your sister. You know, like mm -hmm. you're out there at eight years old, you're eight, you're, you're a child, you're a baby, eight. And, you know, I'm keeping an eye on her and I got to fight if somebody makes fun of her, like real shit. And so, yes, I, I, I do view it that way. So mindset obviously plays a huge part in your life, in your business. Yeah. 
at what point did you start to reflect on your mindset? For me as an athlete, obviously, I understood. I would say around 14, 15, 16, I started to see just better performance when I committed more time to my mental mm. side of it. Mm. The preparation, the um, consistent time, you know, going into a game or practice, just getting ready. So I, I start to really understand if I could feel the difference, see the difference. So that's, I think, the time when I start to reflect on my mindset. When, when was the time for I, you I loved, to- I, I can't believe you brought that up. I flirted with it very lightweight at the, around the same time, 14 to 17, high school. Flirted, didn't understand it. The only thing I knew was, this is weird. I'm playing high school different than the other 250 kids in my class. Mm. I feel no peer pressure. I could give two shits if I'm picked on or don't have social status. I had a very outgoing and like kind of am who I am personality, so I was very liked. But I did something in the 90s in New Jersey. If you weren't picking on kids, you weren't popular. And I wasn't willing to compromise. I wasn't willing to go to the next tier of popularity because I wasn't willing to shit on kids in my class. Yeah, good for you. And I would choose going to a baseball card show and selling on a Friday night instead of going to a cool party that I was invited to that I should have felt cool about. I was only 20% of the class invited. I would go, I would work at my dad's liquor store on the weekends instead of hanging out. I was so different and I sensed it, but it was very hazy. About 20 years later, when I was 35, I'd been putting out content for long enough, telling people, starting in 2006, seven, eight, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, do this, do this, do this. This is how you get more followers. This is how you get more people to buy from you on email. And I was putting out all this content and I started realizing, a lot of people were not doing it. And I started getting fascinated on why. And that's when I had the early epiphanies of like, oh, the whole world is built on self-esteem. You're either confident or you're insecure. Mm. And then a million other variables of how that happens. And I started, to, my content changed. The first five years of me being a businessman content, it's very tactical. Set up this website, post at this time, da 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 and then you could you can start to see after I started to get like, and I started reading the DMs and they're like, hey, but if I post, what if I don't like the way I look? And I'm like, mm. whoa, yeah. right. Oh, like my husband doesn't think I should be doing this. I'm like, oh, right. Like, you know, and yeah. by the way, my childhood was not all roses. My mom was incredibly optimistic. My dad was incredibly pessimistic. You know, multiple, and most of my relatives, including my mom's side, were pessimistic. They grew up in the Soviet Union. They always thought there was a conspiracy. You know, I get it. Mm -hmm. At the time, I didn't get it. Yeah. I would judge my uncles, my grandmom. Mm -hmm. Like, I was like, why is everyone so negative? Like, now I'm like, wait a minute. Right. They lived in the worst place in the world at the time. Well, it, the mindset is a tool. It, you don't use mindset as a tool to deal with the great times. Like, whoever thinks, like, I got to spend more time on my mindset when everything's going great. This is where gratitude and appreciation is the tool. Right. So, like, to think keep about, it. Brother, think about how I started the opening of this podcast. It's on an everyday basis this morning, mm -hmm. this morning, while brushing my teeth and listening to Boomer talk about the Jets and the Rangers. <laughs> I was like, man, good day. All right. Thank it's you. It's a good day. Yeah. It's a good, yeah. like, real talk. And by the way, it's practice. Mm -hmm. One thing I've, uh, by the way, step three, first, I didn't understand, like I just said. Then I started understanding. Now I'm going into a third phase where I'm trying to tell people, friends first, I'm starting to realize, oh shit, I practice. Yeah. I say to myself, you are lucky. Mm. This is a great day. Mm -hmm. Like, n n I have, you want to hear something insane that I would tell everyone, especially people of any level of status? I believe the single reason I am joyous is because I have no attachment to my professional and financial success. I have I feel like zero of my identity is the Gary V or the businessman. It is completely and utterly baked into my self-worth is baked into how I feel people feel about me based on how much they know me. Yesterday, what you two thought about me is going to be was very low on a mattering to me 
it is now grown after this hour, my yeah. sister more so. Yeah. It's just a pecking order. So I think for a lot of people, if you're a, somebody did something at a Jets game this weekend, I, they got introduced to me and they told me their full profession in the intro. Hey, John Thompson, <laughs> doctor at this, like, and I'm like, you know, I, I take note. Of, yeah, I think yeah. about that. I'm like, I see, he, that's his validation. Sure. And I think about it, like, you know, listen, we, we can't go through this podcast without talking about how handsome Henrik is, right? Like, yeah. I, I, It's actually I, written into the... Is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. But, but it's funny, I'm going to use it as something I talk a lot about. I worry that parents give validation to their children around grades because mm -hmm. it's a very fake system. I worry that parents give validation on looks. Mm -hmm. You know, if a child is told, and there's there's a small percentage of people like Henrik who are just born attractive, <laughs> and it's going yeah. to be a constant theme in their life, and especially for young women. Yeah. You know, you think about that, you know, then all of a sudden in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s, in your 60s, it, it, I am curious about how people validate themselves. Is it school? Is mm -hmm. it money? Is it zip code? Is it the car you drive? Is it how you look? Is it what you accomplish on the ice? Followers. Accomplish... Followers, like. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a very big deal. Yeah. And I think about it a lot. Yeah. I so guess there, I think both things are true. So like obviously practice, you're at an elevated level of gratitude and appreciation and maybe in your words you go on the offensive, right? Every day on that. I think when you first find those tools, it's not because things are, you got an eighth place trophy. It's because you lose and you have the lesson, right? And you think, how do I deal with this? How do I, how do I love myself when I just lost this thing or got a That's bad right. grade? And so that, I think there's a correlation between how early we adopt those tools and start practicing and, and how adverse our life is, how many challenges we have to face. And who is around you to contextualize the failure. Yeah. yeah, that would actually be my next question. How important is your surroundings Everything. in yeah. terms of how you feel and uh, mindset? How do, how do you keep a great mindset? How important is your team around you? I would argue that there is a level of guilt that I walk around with every day that I got the super mom and others didn't. Mm. And one person that didn't was my dad. And I love my grandma Esther, but, and by the way, I knew her mom, my great grandma Anya, there was a lot of negativity. And so the insanity of the difference of seeing my parents, and my dad gave me a ton of weapons, meaning he gave me a ton of good stuff. My competitive, my mom's pretty competitive too, she likes to hide it, but my dad's really competitive and work ethic. I mean, my dad came to this country and I basically didn't see him for the first 10 years. He established us, you know? Hmm. Um, but the surroundings is the whole ball game. With the level of guilt that I walk around, I believe that's another reason I'm so compelled to make content. I feel like, you know, yesterday I walked out of a, a meeting and this 15 year old kid came up to me. He's like, Gary Vee, love your stuff, selfie. And it was funny like where my brain goes. I'm like, man, I don't know if that kid has got great situation at home or not great situation at home, but I'm really pumped that he watches my videos. Not because I necessarily need it. Of course it feels nice, you're a human. Like, I'm a human, but fuck. Like, there are so many people that don't have a positive influence and a decoder of the macro in their lives. And I'm so happy. You know, we demonize social media and society now for all of its, yeah. but all that social media is is a mirror of society. They're, social media is empty. Mm. It's an empty vessel. Yeah. It's not the news. The news programs. Social media is us. Yeah. Social media is us. Yeah. And so I'm so happy that I mean, and I get this, by the way, I get it every day. Henrik, you know how you walk around this town. Like, you know, as someone who is very affected by athletes' performance and like the joy it brings me in the escapism that sports is, you know how like how many people thank you for that Stanley Cup run or your career? It feels nice. They're like, thank you. Like, it happens. Like, to me, people saying thank you for like putting a video that changes the perspective, that it, you're helping people. Mm -hmm. It's why we love music. Yes. And sports, we get to escape our truth and get joy. But man, Henrik, surroundings is everything. And I would say if your surroundings aren't great, starting to limit your time with people that are negative is the practice. Just like I practice in the morning, brush my teeth, I'm like, you're lucky today, it's a good day. And not like, again, it's, I think sometimes people see this stuff and they think it's dorky or like, I, I think it's the most real, I, I think it's like doing push-ups. And then the limiting of negativity. If you're watching the news constantly, you're gonna be upset. 
if you're, if you're, you know, if you're, it really mo- affects you. It really affects mm-hmm. you. If your mother is negative, you can't, like, it's probably not ideal to cut your mother out of your life. And I know that a lot of people have asked their mother to go to therapy and this, and they won't. I get that. But you don't need to talk to her four times a day either and listen to her vent. You're allowed to protect yourself and say to your mom, we're going to do this once every two days now. You're allowed. You're in control of breaking the pattern. Yeah. Like I always tell people, complaining is like a funny game. Like the only people that listen to you complain is other complainers or people that have to because they're your loved ones. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, I think you're in control. And you know, it's funny with, you know, talking about the part of the world you're from. I literally on stage say all the time, I'm like, what do you want to complain about? You don't like your job? You can quit. I understand that you have a mortgage in this, but you can live under less means. You can buy less clothes. You can take different transportation. You can not take a vacation that year. You know, like, you can do something to fight for your happiness. When it's po- next year, because it's going to be a, a political year, I promise you on stage I'll say, you don't like who wins the presidency this year and you don't like it, move to Sweden. I always say that. <laughs> I always say that. Right. You know, like, you know that. Like, I, I literally say that. And by the way, because I mean it, you are allowed to move to Toronto. Sure. You're allowed. Like, you're so lucky. My family wasn't. Russia was a jail. The USSR was a jail from 1917 to 1989. You weren't allowed to leave the country for vacation. So, like, we're fortunate. And I think that's how I think about it. Yeah. What's more important to you? I think I know the answer. But I still I wrote it you down. Wrote it down so you ask What's it. more important to you, success or happiness? Oh, happiness. Yeah. Because ha- happiness is success. Mm-hmm. I think we need to redefine success. Mm-hmm. You know, at, you know, it's funny you ask me. Was it money? It sure wasn't, and and like that was weird to me for a while as a kid. I would sell baseball cards. I would work, but I would get the money and I would put it back into the business. Right, like I would get money with selling baseball cards. I would buy more baseball cards. Right, like I didn't want the cool jacket. I definitely didn't want Jordans because I was a Knicks fan. And I would never wear them. <laughs> you know, like you know, there was very few things I bought as a child. Like I didn't want stuff. Stuff is not interesting to me. I love when people are passionate about stuff. When I think about you, Henrik, from afar, especially with like, you know, even like watching you set up the aesthetics here, I pay attention to that stuff. I'm like, man, of course he likes fashion. Like he's visual. Right, like, like I, I think that's cool. I'm not uh, fancy cars. I'm always scared. Is that person buying a fancy car to close the gap on insecurity, and they want to show people they made it, or did they grow up passionate about the cars? They understand the horsepower. Mm-hmm. They, you know, with wine for me, I will buy expensive wine. Mm-hmm. I don't do it for the flex. I do it because I spent my whole life learning about it. I'm interested in it. Sure. I'm curious. Last night I ordered a Quesita Creek, which is Washington State's best Cabernet with my friend Craig. I was just curious how it tasted. Yeah. Can mm-hmm. you tell our listen, listeners a little bit about, about your history with wine? Yeah. And so it's my dad, been a big part. Yeah, my yeah. dad you know, lived the American dream, went from a stock boy in a liquor store in Clark, New Jersey, to eventually buying his own liquor store in New Jersey in Springfield. I was first born, oldest son, only son, you know, only kid in, that was born in the old country. So it was very merchant son, so very cliche. At 14, I started stocking the shelves. Like I lived that life that I think we've heard those stories from others. Somewhere around 16, because the store was in Springfield, New Jersey, which means on one side it was like Union, Elizabeth, very blue collar. On the other side of the store was Short Hills, Milburn, Summit, Livingston, bougie. Yeah. My dad was in the liquor business. He was a liquor and beer guy. I'm a watcher, as I've been explaining Mm -hmm. in this podcast. So the summers and the weekends I'm working, I'm like, people are asking for this wine stuff. And they're asking for, you know, I was very businessy already. Somebody would come in, they're like, do you have Camus Cabernet? I'm like, no, I don't think we have it. And then I'd go to the, there was like a big guide where you could buy from. Mm -hmm. I would look it up and be like, this is $30? You know, because we were selling five, $10 wines. Right. So that's interesting. And then my life, literally my life changed in one moment. A man comes in and it's, this story's hazy to me, meaning I remember the moment, but I don't remember exactly what the man said. I don't even really fully remember what he looks like. It's one of those, you remember what you feel, but you know? Yeah. And he goes, hey, I'm looking for this, this, and this. And at this point, I kind of knew what Opus One and Chateau Lafitte were. And, um, and I was like, we don't have it. And I was like, let me try to get it. Got into talking to him. And he's like, yeah, like I'm building my collection. That was it. 
the man said, I'm building my collection. I just moved into Short Hills. I have a wine room. I'm building my collection. And I was like, people collect wine. And I was full court trading cards. Do you know how many Brian Leach 1990 rookie cards I have? <laughs> like How many? Like a thousand. Actually, no way. Yes. Yes. Like I wow. was full throttle. Like wow. that 88 Olympic team, Richter and Leach, when they did a special on them, and this was pre-internet, so you didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know that they were gonna be, like I was already a Rangers, the, I became a Rangers fan in 86, when they made that huge run, and they lost in the conference finals to this rookie goaltender named Patrick Roy, and I was like, <laughs> this guy, he's not gonna be good. <laughs> anyway, that was when I completely fell in love. The 88 Olympics came right behind that, and the big feature, these young kids, could they do it? 1980 was only eight years earlier, so could we do it? We got blown out, got killed by the Russians. but. Leach and Richter were on that team. And so those were my guys. And then obviously that became the core team that won the cup finally in 94. Anyway, I was like, people collect wine. And literally, King, from that day, those next 20 years of my life, I spent 95% of my energy on building that wine business and learning about wine. So and you're by, an expert. I, I am an expert. And yeah. by the way that people define expert, like I can speak to wine at an incredibly high level. I can taste wine out of a brown paper bag and likely tell you, this is Pinot Noir from France, maybe even this vintage. And then you pull it out and you're like, holy shit. Hmm. Like I know it that well. Did you watch the uh, sour grapes? Of course. Yeah. Like everything. That was like, amazing. Of that was incredible. Amazing. amazing. Wine was my life for 20 years. I, I still, you know, it's funny when I left it, because it was my life. Oh, I'm actually, I'll ask you this question. About five years after, when I left, I, about two, three years later, I started loving wine again. You know, it's kind of like, mm. I think about athletes. I'm like, I wonder how, as, as time goes from your retirement, do you watch, do you watch the game differently? Because when you're in something, it's different. Yeah. And I get more joy with wine today than I did 20 years ago. I, I totally understand that. Yeah. First year out of retirement, it was kind of weird yeah. to watch a game. It yeah. brought up a lot of emotions feelings. and, and I feelings. Me, and you know, yeah. I think step by step, you start coming back to watching the game as a fan again. It's cool. And you stop relating to yourself. And I still do that when I analyze the game because I bring out my own experience. Of course. Um, but I remember that first year out of retirement. Yes, it was weird. And at times a little hard because... It was such a big part of my life for of such a long time, right? Of course. Um, but then, we're what, three years out now? Uh, I, I really enjoy it. I mean, I, I, I've always been a hockey fan. Like, Which I love huge. watching I, the and game. You know this, and, and tell people at home, a lot of guys are not fans of the sports they play. True. Yeah, it was their way out. It was their way to hmm. money, success, opportunity. And then other guys love the sport more than, right. you know. I, I, I know American football the best. And I do think I have a different experience watching Jets football than Knicks and Rangers and Yankees because I understand it so deeply. And I think one of the cool things that former athletes have when they watch sports, when they're able to transition back to fan, is they enjoy it a lot because they actually really see things we can't see. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you like, if the announcer doesn't get to saying that the defenseman should have come in on that play, you're capable of knowing that, and that makes it more joyous. And I, I, I find that it's really, back to, actually this is a fun topic to talk about here. For me, wine, American football, um, collectibles, trading cards, sneakers, uh, NFT, like collectibles, um, are great joys because I know them deep. I think more people going deeper into the things they like is something I think more people should do. Like if you collect watches, now spend an extra hour a day at night instead of watching a Netflix show, watch YouTube videos about watches. Like going deeper into passions, yeah. I think is a really interesting topic I've been marinating on. Yeah, I saw, I saw something the other day, that, which is a simple stat, which said if you spend that one extra hour for 60 days, you'll be in the top decile of knowledge. Of owners, a thing. Of a thing. Wow. And to me, that's fast. That is fast. Right? You know, I, I, and I've been thinking about this, especially towards the end of my career and after my retirement. Having a really strong passion for something, it's not a guarantee, right? I think there's a lot of people that they're still looking for it. 
I, I felt very fortunate to find my passion at age six. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My passion was to play hockey. Yeah. Play sports early on, but hockey became very clear to me. So he guided me yeah. throughout my life. And that, that's the biggest thing I want for my kids now, just to find a passion for something. I say the something. same thing. So right. many people are like, Gary, you want your kids to be entrepreneurs? I'm like, absolutely not. Unless they're purebred entrepreneurs. Right. You want them to be I, curious. Yeah, curious. Yeah. By the way, that's a word. Can we talk about yeah, that word? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I'm pumped you brought that up. I do think that most of us are not talking about curiosity as a superpower enough. And all of the parents listening, if you see that you have a curious kid, you need to become a cheerleader of that. Mm-hmm. If they want to cook one weekend, let's go. Yeah. If they want to rock climb, let's go. If they want to pick up a guitar, cool. If they're asking you about the Japanese whiskey you're drinking, not yet, kid, but let me tell yeah. you about it. You know, right. like I do think curiosity has a real play in happiness and i've been thinking about it a lot yeah i think right now the world is in this revert to norm mode which is like i'm going to tell you how it is like don't ask until like things get better Hmm. like this is just how it is Hmm. and this is i think these moments when the world feels bleak and and pessimistic Mm -hmm. is when curiosity as a superpower gets us out i like that right I really like that, brother. I really, I think, you know, look, I I think about the people who would be listening to this and obviously a lot of love to the man here with us. And I think about like, what's the profile? What are they thinking about? And, you know, one of the great things about having all those followers that you mentioned in the beginning is reading the DMs. The reason I'm, you know, people are like, why are you so early on stuff? Like, how'd you know TikTok or this? Or Mm. I'm like, because I'm listening. Mm. I'm paying attention. Mm. Like, why? Why? Everything is why. What, and that goes back to curiosity. Yeah. Why are people wearing, you know, remember like three, four years ago when almost everybody wore tight jeans and then like baggy came and like, why do men wear nail polish now more often? And why, and why, mm-hmm. and why, and why? And I think I think there's a lot of power to that why. And I think it also is grounded a little bit in, in not having as much fear. I think the world is very aggressively selling fear, even parenting. If you think about how parents predominantly parent a kid, they try to scare them out of doing things, mm. right? It's a very like, don't do that. You're going to, you know, like they, they you fear. You have to stop yourself sometimes. That's right? Yeah. No, right. I can catch myself. Yeah, like all I get us. A, I got to stop us. saying stop. That's yeah. right. <laughs> don't do that. That's right. Yeah. All of us. And listen, I get it. You love them more than breathing. Yeah. I mean, the, it's the ultimate love for anyone who's listening, who doesn't have that yet. It is the ultimate love. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I really love my parents and everybody in my family. It's There's just, just a the distance. Like they're yours. Yeah. It's you. It's the, the mm-hmm. scariest thing, especially yeah. if you get fortunate enough. If one of them is kind of like you, you're like, this is insane. Like yeah. you know. So anyway, I, I I do think though that parents have to catch themselves because these kids are getting fed fear everywhere. And so you, this goes back to the inner circle. I think everyone here needs to find a source of offense and optimism and happiness, whether that is other human beings, which I always think is the best way, but you might do it yourself through exercise, meditation, right? Therapy. You know, I'm so happy we're finally here that we can, like I, 20 years ago, I'm not saying that out loud. Mm-hmm. It was taboo. It was, yeah, it was stigma. It was stigma. It was, you need to, you're broken. That's right. Yeah. Just like alcoholism, just like yeah. domestic abuse, just like a m- many things we've solved. I'm so pumped we're on this one because I believe the brain is the game. You know, I believe the operating system of us is how we feel about ourselves. And, you know, I'm, I'm, these are important conversations we're having. Yeah. And gratitude. I mean, you start the show with talking a lot about gratitude. And, and it's funny how how we think will change everything in every experience. Everyday experience, will the, the outcome of that will start with how we choose to think, right? And, and I think the last couple of years, I went more from performance focus to just how, how do I feel, more gratitude. And uh, I feel like my focus is way more towards happiness. It's good. Uh, which is a great you. feeling. And 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 you should. Henry, like in do you know that there's 735 million people that don't have access to water? Clean water. 735 million. 10% of the earth can't get to clean water within a day. Mm. Right? We get so caught up in our real lives. I mean like like you you are so fortunate 
you know, as long as everyone is healthy, everything that you worked hard for has created a very special life. And like, it's awesome. And you were born at the right time. Like, we could have all been born in 1643. We could have been born in 1801, right? You could have been, I mean, going back to what I said earlier, we're not far removed from our great grandparents. Think about this. If you're born in Europe in 19... 1901, right? You have World War I, you have World War II, you have a genocide of Nazi Germany, and you're 45 years old and you've lived through all that. Mm-hmm. You Black Plague, uh, you have, like the Great Depression. Like, right. yeah. I mean, we're just incredibly fortunate, most yeah. of us. And, and so please everyone, because inevitably something bad will happen. Unfortunately for all of us, most people live a life, unless you're the unfortunate one who dies early, which is terrible, but most of us will go through very hard heartache of losing the closest people to us, definitely who are older than us. Definitely. Losing parents is fucking horrible if you love them. And everyone loves their parents even when it's fucked up. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So I think on the days that are good, really try to start enjoying them. Because if you're complaining about like your boss is a dick or or the Rangers <laughs> lost to the Blue Jackets, <laughs> like, you know, like, or like, like, you gotta, you gotta put it in perspective. We need better perspective. Yeah. Do you prioritize the same things today as you did, let's say, 10 years ago? Yes. Same things? Same thing 10 years ago. 20 years ago? 47. Now um, you started to get pretty young. If yes, you go 20 same years. things. Yeah. I, I've been pretty much since, I would say, 22, like right out of school. I, basically, mm-hmm. so I hated school. And I couldn't wait to be an entrepreneur. And I was like, you know, probably since I was 11, I was like, when I'm 22, like that's how I thought. So I was so happy that first day of work. And basically, I already knew I was gonna be successful. I was too talented, you know, unlike sports. That's why I hurt for some athletes and you're gonna, I'm gonna actually ask you a question. Who was the most talented player coming up your life that got hurt by injuries that you know would have been an NHL superstar? but you remember them getting hurt or, uh, so give it some thought, but Mm, unlike athletes, when you're a businessman and you've recognized you're extremely talented, again, unless you have a very serious health situation, Mm -hmm. you are going to be successful. Unlike, I'll use basketball because it pops to mind, Greg Oden, who was the number one pick in the NBA, like would have been a very successful basketball player, but his knees did not hold up, right? Henrik, anybody come to mind? Well, I, I just remember not so much injuries. It was more their mindset. Mind, their yeah. mind. mind. Because well, I that rem- happens all the time. I remember at 13, 14, 15, a couple of guys, they were so talented. And I, I thought to myself, there's no way they these guys are not, not going to play yeah. for the national team in the NHL. Yeah. And then three years later, Gone. it was mm-hmm. fast too. It yeah. was at well, that, that was age that era, where, that's right. you know, you, that you need to commit. Yeah, that, there's a couple of guys there that that stands out, and and I remember thinking back, oh wow, I really thought that guy would be like one yeah. of the best that, players. By in the way, time. that's why that's why I use sports as an analogy for everything. Yeah, I tried to bring up one where he could say, you know, obviously Henrik's a gracious man; he's not going to call out those humans. I wanted him to give love to some guy who might hear this and say, "Fuck, I would have," you know, like the yeah. injury stopped him. It wasn't mine. Uh, right to Henrik's point, and I want everybody to listen to this in sports. All of us that are close to it, I have a sports agency. We rep football players, Mm. UFC fighters, baseball. We almost got into hockey a couple years ago in a merger, but we'll get there eventually. Mm. Anyway, nonetheless, we all know if we're close to it, how many people don't succeed because of mind. Yeah. In life, it's more hidden. In sports, this is why I love sports. It suffocates all of it. It's black and white. Mm -hmm. In life, you can make pretend that it wasn't you, but it was you. Right. It was your mindset. You had the talent. You could have been a great CEO. Mm -hmm. You could have been one of the C-suite executives Mm -hmm. for Coca-Cola. You could have been a great engineer. Totally. Do you ever read that book, uh, George Lois, um, Great Advice for People Who Work Hard? Mm Mm-mm. It's basically, now everybody says hard work beats talent and it's become like a yeah. tag, but I I really believe that, right? Which is, you can make a brand as an entrepreneur around hard work and and not have the, the, the deep depth of experience to take on- Hard work is not subjective and it's not debatable. That's right. Like- Either you do 100 push-ups or you do 10. Right. Either you put in the 10 hours of hard work or you put in six. Now, there are many people right now talking to us in their car or while they're running and they're like, yeah, but you gotta work smart. And they're right. Yeah. 
Yeah. There are people that work eight, hard can come in a lot of, just like you made that great point earlier, hard can come in different factors. Uh, there are a lot of people who work 13 hour days doing hard labor. Sure. And it might not be the most strategic work that that person could be doing. But work ethic is a huge variable. Yeah. It's a huge variable in life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, you brought up uh, Vanier Sports. And yes. Hank and I were talking about this beforehand. You know, you have a successful business and then you look at, oh, I think the, the agency, for somebody out there who thinks, I want to be an agent. Yep. Right? Or I want to start an agency. Yep. A lot of people who I talk to think like, well, I can't do that because CAA and yep. WME are already there. Like, how am I going to beat them? Yeah. Right. Tell us how you you go into a space where all the signs say no, like yeah. it's already done. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. How does an entrepreneur get past that initial hurdle? Um, talent and strategy. First, it was a story of joy and success being defined as happiness. My mm. brother has Crohn's disease. He had a tough spell in his mid twenties, and lay, I'm sure laying in that hospital bed, he said, "What am I doing with my life?" Yeah. And he decided he wanted to be happier. And he decided that the marketing company we were building was successful, but it wasn't making him happy. Mm. So he decided and said to me, he wants to leave and start a sports agency, he wants to be an NFL agent. And of course, you know, I'm the older brother by 11 years. So I'm like, I want to support him blindly. I was like, shit, now I got to do this whole agency thing by myself. <laughs> and of course, my brain goes to where I'm at. I'm like, well, let's become the biggest. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I'm doing this for lifestyle a little bit more. I'm like, I don't care. You want me involved? We're going. You know? <laughs> we're gonna, I was like, we're going. We, we, yeah. we, we found our balance. Nonetheless, I love competing. And when you love competing and you love the game, you may hate to lose, but you have to respect the outcome. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs hate on fellow entrepreneurs and it drives me crazy. I understand it, mm. but, but for me, the answer to your question, this is for everyone listening, no matter what you do, just because Ice Spice and Cardi B and Nicki Minaj are successful female rappers has zero to do with your ability to become a successful or Sexy Red. Sexy Red and Ice Spice did not get stopped by Cardi B and Nicki Minaj. Right. No one on earth, no organization, no person is actually stopping you from your thing. The world is abundant. There was no part of me that was like, oh my God, it's impossible. Mm. Of course I knew it would take us 10 years to build a reputation to allow us to get to the number one pick and because CAA would go into the living room and say, we've repped the last 50, you know, right. and we would be like, hey, we, we know marketing. Mm -hmm. Like I knew mm -hmm. that was, you know, a knife to a gunfight at first. But here we are eight, nine, 10 years later, and we're starting to get very different outcomes and athletes. And so it's just putting in the work. It's not saying no, right? To your point, a lot of this talk has been about mindset. If you've said no about anything, then that means it's already over. You're actually right, it's over. Mm -hmm. If you say maybe, it becomes a whole different life. And so CAA, WME didn't scare me, but I respect the piss out of them and Wasserman and all the other great agencies, but I'm gonna try to build the biggest. People sometimes hear me, like I did it earlier, I'll inevitably get a DM and be like, hey, heard you on Club 30, Henrik's class, you're trash. Really, this will happen. Mm. They'll say, you think you're gonna build fucking, you think, you? who do you think you are? And I will reply. I will reply and say, no, no, I don't think I'm them, but I'm inspiring and I'm aiming for it. And I may not get there, but I don't even understand why I wouldn't try mm. to. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I'm delusional, I think I'm capable. I've won in marketing, I've won in sports, I've won in wine, like I'm a mm. winner and I wanna go for it. Yeah. I understand it's outlandish. I would even say out loud, it's unlikely to build an intellectual property that's as, Disney, forget about it. Like it's gonna take everything I got and sure. a hell of a lot of things bouncing in the right way, the puck bouncing uh, the right way yeah. for me to get to that. But why wouldn't I try? Of course. Right. So when you do start something new like that, how important is it to know where you're trying to go? Like the plan itself. I think if you go super macro, at 11 years old, I decided I wanted to buy the New York Jets. I believe there's a direct correlation to the amount of success I've had based on that. Is that happening? I think it is. You know, I really have this weird feeling that in 20 years, I'm gonna pull it off. Like, look, the Johnson family may never wanna sell it. That's not in my control. What's in my control is 
Will I have the capacity to create that level of insane wealth? Because I don't do it for the money, it does scare me that I can't get there. I don't operate to maximize money, I operate to maximize joy. And so I don't think I've, even though I've accumulated a lot of money, I'm very aware that I could have accumulated more. I've done a lot of high risk, high reward investing. If I just did real estate in the stock market, I would have more money. I'm aware of that. But if I, I want to buy, I want to get to my goals my way. Mm. You know, I want it, I want it, I'm about the process. You know, like, of course I want to hoist the Stanley Cup, but I can only control how I show up every day in front of the net. Mm -hmm. That's what you did. Mm -hmm. And, and, and much like being on a team, even though I'm the entrepreneur and even though it's all on me, I don't control the world. I don't control when inflation comes in. I don't control when there's an innovation uh, that's invented like AI that takes away an advantage that I built for 15 years. Mm -hmm. I control my reaction to it. I can cry about it or I can say, fuck, okay, let's put on the fucking helmet and go, <laughs> go to, to work. work. Yeah. So that's how I think about it. Um, listen, we, we're running out of time, but bef before I let you go, I want to leave you with this. Other than the Jets winning the Super Bowl, yes. what else are you dreaming about right now? Man, I love consistency. and I, So the Jets is the fun thing, and the real thing is I dream every day for the 10 to 15 people that are closest to me to be okay. Mm. And genuinely, when you asked me earlier, are you seeing it the same way as you did 10 years ago, 20 years ago? That's all I've done, always. Please let the people I love be healthy and happy to the best of like God's choices. And two, put on my helmet and go to work. Like I don't know anything else. I keep it, I'm so simple guys. Mm. I'm fucking simple. It's so basic for me. I, under, I, I just see it so clearly. I'm, you know, and I, and I desperately want that for everyone else. And that's why I choose to do things like this for an hour. I got a lot of things to do. Sure. I do this because I know that this is, first, I admire the shit out of you and I was pumped to get to know you. Two, I know there's a lot of people listening that don't know me. This is enough out of my circle. Yeah. And, and maybe have seen me at the garden or this and that, or maybe you've seen one thing about me. And, and I'm hoping that it inspires someone to be like, to think like my whole life is based on humans saying things that made me think differently. My whole life. Yeah. My, uh, there was a really raunchy thing. I think this will be fun to say. It'll be a funny gag to end with because I know you guys, I got to definitely run. When I was 14, there was this 85 year old, super old school, 85 year old liquor salesman that called on my dad's account. I was 15. And like, he was 85 in 1990, so he was like incredibly politically incorrect. When I think back to him, I don't think he said anything that was politically correct. <laughs> this is actually one of the least politically incorrect things he said to me. I was like talking to him, now he's 16, he's a little bit older, and um, I was talking about hiring because I was starting to help hire for my dad's store. Neil, I know you're listening, that's his nephew. We, I worked closely with him as a distributor for a long time. I was talking about this, about hiring. I was like, Willie, you know, like, didn't I? He goes, kid, let me tell you something. You never know what you got until you sleep with it. And what he was saying in a raunchy way is, I'm not gonna know if the person's a good worker until they start working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think about that kind of stuff. And so that's, that's the stuff that I, like, I think we need more perspective. And, um, and I'm hopeful to inspire someone. Willie saying that to me shaped my perception on hiring. I went on to hire 10,000 people in the next 20 years between all my companies. That helped me. A single man while I was stocking a shelf for two seconds. Somebody is literally on elliptical right now and one of the things the three of us said here will shape a different perspective and my intent is for their life to be better because of it because that's nice and mm. nice is good. Mm. I love it. Thank you so Thank much. You, yes. It was Thanks, so Gary. nice to have you here. Thank you. That was, that was awesome. Great. All right. That was Gary V, everyone. Um, Takeaways, Jay? Uh, I'm interested to hear, to, to see whether uh, the DMs uh, or our direct, <laughs> or, or the comment section, uh, what that brings and, and whether we can get Gary to answer some questions in there as well. Um, I, I love this sit down. Yeah. Uh, I love the fact that, you know, when we do meet new people and the, how much you can learn. And, and I was really inspired to how he, you know, 
takes on new challenges. And I love the fact that gratitude is a big part of his life mm -hmm. and it guides him a lot. Um, so there's a lot of takeaways for me that I'll, uh, I'll remember for sure. Yeah, no doubt. We we're really fortunate and, and, and we're, you know, just to be here in the city, um, and have Gary V walk over from his apartment, you know, five minutes away. It's, it's magic here. And the conversations like this are why New York city is the best city in the world. Um, it inspires me that, to think that, you know, Gary Vee, yeah, sure, everybody knows him, but there's equally incredible people walking the street right now all over the place, and it makes me feel really, you know, really grateful that I live in this city. Yeah. Awesome episode, awesome guy. Guys, I really hope you enjoyed this one. Um, have a great week, and uh, see you guys soon. Bye.